Now, I've, you mentioned phenomenological control. I, I call that the the um, the ability for phenomenological control, because in fact, the particular hypnotic context in which it happens, uh, a hypnotist does an induction, so you're becoming more hypnotized, more and more sleepy. That's not that that that's all a relic of the 1800s. Well, that's an important thing to clarify. Yeah. Perhaps even before we go further into the actual yeah. research itself and the, the reality of it, I think it's important to address that because I think for some people, when you just hear hypnosis, all mm. kinds of things jump ahead, like, you know, yeah. fortune tellers, all these sorts of things. Yeah. But it's a very real, so again, from just my limited experience, just reading about this and some of the articles you sent for me to read, you understand very quick, no, this is very real science. This is, this is not... Um, it's just some kind of thing people do for entertainment, if you like. Um, it, exactly. Now, people, I found even scientists have a, have a sort of a, a split personality about hypnosis. Mm. On the one hand, as you say, it smacks of sideshow, circuses, um, you know, rather flaky stuff. On the other hand, it's extremely powerful. Maybe it's even dangerous. Um, and and, and that, that sort of sentiment is also reflected in the law where... Um, legally, if someone's hypnotised, it's regarded as a as a case of not being behaviour not being voluntary. Mm. So it's taken. So the one hand is taken extremely seriously. On the other hand, is extremely flaky. Um, it's very unusual. Yeah, it, it it is it is kind of um, it is kind of strange. And so there, it has all this baggage associated with it, and, and all the all the all these are sort of myths, these mythological beliefs, uh, uh, false beliefs, which are. Uh, perpetrated by our culture, um, and that's why I prefer not to call it hypnosis. Mm. Well, hypnosis is a certain context in which someone called the hypnotist does a hypnotic induction and puts, you know, hypnotizes the person and then gives some hypnotic suggestions. But that's all. All of that um, came about in the eighteen um, hundreds, as I say, uh, with with that sort of terminology. But it was really just people rediscovering something that has been there ever since probably the beginnings of humanity, which is our capacity for phenomenological control. Um, you don't need any of, of, this, of this ritual for people yeah. to exercise this capacity. Mm. Um, it, just, it just defines a context in which a person is saying, for those who have this ability, uh, people have it, most people have some of this ability. For example, 90% of people... If they imagine the hands are magnetic, and they feel a force pulling the hands together, uh, the hands can pull together as if by themselves. And that's what I'm experiencing now, so I'm creating the magnetic hands illusion in myself now. And 90% of people can, uh, can do that. People who are, who are very high on the trait of phenomenological control can create um, even more compelling experiences like hallucinations and delusions um, that fit their, their goals and intentions. Um, so they can create uh, they can create all sorts of experiences that would fit say what they require for that social for that social situation. Let's say you're in a church and um, what's meant to happen is because you're evangelical that the Holy Spirit descends upon you and you talk in tongues. Well, you create the experience of the Holy Spirit descending upon you and you talk in tongues, and it'll feel to you like the Holy Spirit is descending upon you. It's not you talking in tongues; it just happens to you. That's, that's what the, the uh, ability for phenomenological control is. It's the ability to construct experiences that systematically misrepresent reality, but you don't know that you're doing it. But nonetheless, you do it in order to satisfy your own goals. I see, and that's it, the key. And that's the key. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's why it's confused people, because people are doing it for their own goals, but part of your own goal is not knowing that you're doing it. Hmm. Because if you knew you were constructing the experience of talking in tongues, well, that wouldn't be the Holy Spirit doing it then, would it? No. So you have to fool yourself. The only way to achieve the goal of the Holy Spirit making you talk is to fool yourself. That's the capacity for phenomenological control. And it, compli- and it, and it, and it constantly trips people up uh, because of this self-delusion and paradoxical uh, aspect of it. Well, I can imagine, because in particular, with some of the words you've been sort of saying here, and it's, it makes me think of you know, manifesting and all these kinds of mm. things and, and creating illusions. These are terms that I'm seeing, or you see more and more, actually perhaps it's actually always been a thing, but I've just seen more and more in relation to people who are trying to start a business or mm. they're trying to achieve you know, a lot of money and success. You hear a lot of this rhetoric online, in particular on social media, of people that you've got to manifest it, you've got to believe, you've got to become mm. essentially delusional. 
Right. But the thing is, you also, it's a double headed coin because I, I can imagine that there is a lot of benefit to having this kind of delusional sense of a kind of greater purpose. I can imagine, yeah. I, I, I bet, that, and that's what we're going to get into is how this can lead to kind of actually phenomenal things actually happening yeah. because it is a, a strange phenomenon. However, if you're also not living in the real world and you completely fall into these delusions, it doesn't matter how much you believe it. If you've not then had the rational mind to say, whatever it is, prepare your business plan or whatever like that, but you've just gone into a boardroom and you, yeah. you believe that you're going to do it, you're not going to be taken seriously. So no. no matter how real these so visions may it, be. It can be dangerous. <laughs> right. Yeah. I and mean, you might believe you have a practical reason for believing something. But belief doesn't... You don't necessarily have beliefs just because you have a practical reason for believing it. If, if someone says to me... Um, that unless you believe 2 plus 2 equals 1, I'm going to kill you. In an hour's time, you must believe. So this is an example from the philosopher Derek Parfit. Um, so I've got a practical reason for believing something, but I don't have any real sort of knowledge-based reason for believing that. Mm. But our beliefs only really respond to knowledge-based reasons. I, I can't make myself believe something just because I have a practical reason for believing in it. Um, or can I? And that's where phenomenological control comes in. Is this ability to fool ourselves? Uh, so when we have a practical reason for believing something or being in a in a in a perceptual state, um, we can create that state in ourselves. But we have to. But the only way that works is we 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 must fool ourselves and make ourselves think we weren't the ones that did it. Because otherwise, we would no longer believe in it, right? right. Um, so that's what phenomenal control is. It, it makes you think you didn't do it, and. Um, so I gave the I gave gave the example of um, talking tongues, but it also applies to Scientology. What about these out of the body experiences my mum had and the past life experiences? Well, for me, that was all phenomenological control. Right. She had strong reasons for having these experiences because as as you go as you're in Scientology and sort of going up the spiritual levels, having these experiences is precisely what marks you as as being more advanced spiritually. So if you're the sort of person who can construct these experiences of being able to remember past lives, leaving your body, um, speaking to other spirits, uh, then wow, you know, you're making it, you, you're, you're, you're going up and you're more respected in the group. Uh, so that was phenomenological control that enabled that to, to happen. Um, but because you're deceiving myself, my, my, my mother or any, or any of them would be completely convinced that these were genuine memories of past lives uh, and a completely compelling experience of leaving the body. When people have out-of-body experiences, it feels as real as real to them that they're seeing the world from a... that they've actually left the body. They, they now have a viewpoint of the body, outside the body. I see. Could we go in, perhaps, to your mother's out-of-body experiences mm. in a little bit more detail? Obviously, whatever you'd be comfortable sharing, but in mm -hmm. terms of what what did they actually entail? What, what really occurred when we... And what do we really mean when we say like an outer body experience? Well, um, so I, so I, so I'd say sort of a classic out of the body experience is you you know right now it seems to you you have a certain location. If you ask most people where are you, you say well I'm here. No, but where are you exactly? Are you in your fort? You say well no, my fort's down there. Um, most people think if they if you sort of push them a bit, that they don't really reflect on this necessarily much. But um, sort of behind the eyes, in a point, sort of round about this far back from the eyes, something something like that. That's we we have a sense of a sense of the location. Some people actually say the heart, um, but most people it's sort of round about where the eyes are and just back a bit inside the head. Um, and that. That sort of location is partly given, I guess, by the visual experience we have, because any visual experience implies a point of perspective, right. the viewing point. If you, even if you look at a picture, there's a there's a, an implied viewing point for that mm. uh, for that for that picture. So our our sort of um, mental representations have an implied viewing point, which is which is where we are, as it were. Now, when people leave the body, that viewing point shifts to maybe the ceiling. Um, I knew a couple of uh, PhD students at Sussex who when they gave talks they suddenly find themselves on the ceiling uh, looking down at themselves um, giving the talk. Um, and that when that happens 
uh, it seems completely real, just as you looking at me now, it's, it seems, you know, all the visual experiences and the perspective that you have on them mm. is, is absolutely uh, reflecting reality. Well, that's how it is when you leave your body or we'll have an out-of-body experience. Um, you, you see your body. Um, is this similar to as well to like sleep paralysis? Is this, is this similar? It or? can be associated with it. Um, out of body experiences can be associated with um, with with sort of dreaming and being in a sleep like state, maybe being paralysed and then leaving the body. It's like it is sometimes associated, but not necessarily. Hmm. Um, it can it can happen. Um, I was just talking to a, uh, an old colleague of mine who said he. She, when he came to Sussex many, many decades ago to give an interview, uh, he, he gave his talk and um, suddenly found himself looking at himself on the other side, side, side of the room. And he was smoking a cigarette and he said, I hope that guy doesn't burn his fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't for him, he wasn't especially associated with anxiety. Mm. It can be a sort of, maybe the the PhD students who told me about it said was sort of associated with an anxiety of giving a talk, so they sort of dissociate a bit. But it can be associated with intense happiness mm. as well. Um, but the, but the, the key feature of it is you view, you view you, your, your point of view is from outside the body. You're no longer in the body in that sense. And that there's some reality to the feeling. We surveyed um, Peter Lush, who's a postdoc here and I um, surveyed the um, about I can't remember the exact numbers now maybe 400 or so of our maybe 500 um, of the undergraduate psychology students and asked them whether they had this sort of experience we gave them a scale from zero and they had nothing like that to five that it was as real as real so like the classic case I'm talking about but you could give numbers in between like one two three four meaning there's you know, you had something like the experience, but it didn't really feel real. And in fact, 80% of people did have something like that experience. I was rather amazed by that. Uh, and then you get the 10% who have it as real as real. But it seems actually very common to have some graded experience of, the, of that sort uh, amongst people. Um, and I think, and we found that it's people high on phenomenological control the higher you are in phenomenal control, the more likely and stronger an experience that, that uh, you'll tend to have. So people who, who are sort of zero in phenomenal control won't have anything like, like this sort of experience at all. So, first, so then, yeah, by the looks of it, most people then can experience these kinds of... To some things. degree, and right. if you're high in phenomenal control, which we, which we do in a sort of a 45-minute test, um, you can have it quite, in a quite compelling way.